Hey guys, it's Bella. Welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are all having an incredible day today. I hope you're ready to get stuck into another Mystery Monday case. Even though I don't think this is going up on a Monday, but you know, I really need to get better at uploading these on Mondays. <laughs> anyway, before we get into the case, I just want to thank today's sponsor, Case Defy, for making this video possible. You guys know by now that I love Case Defy. They are the only cases I use on my phone. They're so cute while still being really protective and slim. They're not bulky like a lot of other protective phone cases are. The impact cases are engineered with a two layer construction of Chi Tech and they're also approved for drops of up to 6.5 feet and the ultra impact cases are approved for drops of 9.8 feet and they're all also made of 50% recycled materials. Recycled materials, yeah, nice, awesome. <laughs> They also have an antimicrobial coating, which kills 99% of bacteria. There are a ton of different designs, so there's really something for everyone, and they're also customizable, so you can get your name, someone else's name, or a monogram on the case. I have this mirror case, which is probably my favorite case of all time. It looks amazing, but also the mirror is so good. I can actually like do my makeup in it, pick something out of my tooth, you know, check my lipstick. I am obsessed with the black and green checkers on this one. It is so unique and fun. And and then last but not least, how cute is this case? So if you guys are in need of a new case or just want to go and check them out, you can get 15% off if you go to casetify.com slash Bella. And speaking of cases, let's go ahead and get into today's case. So today we're going to be talking about another sold Australian case and we're going to be talking about serial sex murderer Mark Aaron Rust. He was born in 1965 in Wyala, South Australia, which is around 380 kilometers from Adelaide. And this guy was a walking red flag right from the get go. When he was 13 years old, he started to notice women and whenever he would see a girl that he found pretty, he would basically follow her around fantasizing about having sex with her until eventually he started to to expose his shriveled little genitals to women and realized, hey, I enjoy this way more than just doing my thing in private like a normal person. And he realized he enjoyed getting this horrified and disgusted, shocked look from women. And so when he saw a woman that he found attractive in public, he would get his dick out and he would occasionally start masturbating in front of them as well. So Mark was a self-described loner. He had one friend, this guy named Craig, and he would tell Craig pretty much everything. He would tell him about the thoughts that he was having, about the things that he was doing to these women, and he also told him that he liked to scare schoolgirls, so he would basically go to bus stops and expose himself to them. And let me read you a quote of what Craig said. He said, he had his silly ways of course, but was a normal sort of bloke. If mum and dad needed help, he would be there. He was very helpful. Like, am I missing something? I just wouldn't describe a man literally traumatizing women and young girls as having silly ways. Oh, that's just Mark. Just in his spare time, he goes around traumatizing women and young schoolgirls by exposing his shriveled genitalia to them. So anyway, Mark had some problems in the bedroom. He either couldn't get hard or didn't have the sex drive despite having the urge to have sex often. He also had a few failed relationships. His first marriage only lasted 18 months and not a lot was really known about it. Just after that marriage ended, Mark was sent to jail for causing $642,000 worth of suburban property damage in Kensington and Norwood. Six years later, he married his second wife and they were having some difficulties having children. So they went and saw a specialist and that's when they found out that Mark had Klinefelter syndrome Which is basically where a boy is born with an extra X chromosome and it results in shrunken testicles and a lower production of testosterone So that's why he had like shriveled little genitals now, their marriage was already on the rocks by this point, but then in 1999, Mark's wife's daughter claimed that Mark sexually assaulted her and the marriage ended for good. Mark was never formally charged with the assault, but he did have to attend a couple of sessions of the sex offenders treatment program, but he went to the first session and ended up leaving halfway through because he thought it was stupid. And then he got worse after this, like much, much worse. And just two months later, he came across Maya Jakic. Maya was born on the 25th of January in 1969 and grew up in Zadar, Croatia. In August of 1990, she was forced to flee the country and moved to Marsden in Adelaide, where she lived with her mother, Jagoda, and her stepfather, John. By 1997, she was working as a sales assistant at Perucci and Rundle Mall, and she was described as an exceptional employee, vivacious, and happy. Um, but she was also known to be quiet and polite, and she kept to herself. She didn't really mix 
mixed with other people a lot and didn't really have that many friends. She was close with a woman named Ida Gregov and they would speak on the phone once a month and Ida said that Maya was having some problems with her family and was kind of like constantly fighting with her mother. By 1999, I guess everything just kind of bubbled up to the point where Maya just felt like she couldn't live peacefully with her family anymore. So she went and moved to an apartment in Glenelg and kind of closed off from her mother a lot. She visited on the 6th of April of that year and got in a particularly bad fight with her mum and stormed out of their house at around 4pm. And unfortunately, that would be the last time her family would ever see her alive. It's not known exactly where Maya went or what she did in the days following, but there were some witnesses who claimed to have seen her at a Caltech servo in Bolivar on the 9th of April. She was apparently talking to staff there and was complaining about being kicked off a bus to Port Augusta. And on the 12th of April, she was also spotted at Jetty Road in Glenelg, which was not far from where her apartment was situated. What we do know is that on the afternoon of the 12th of April, Maya went to Payneham. At the time, Mark Ross was working as a taxi driver and he was driving around the area looking for a fare to pick up when he saw Maya walking down Paynham Road and he pulled up next to her in his taxi and asked her if she wanted a lift. And Maya said no and so he said, how about a route? And Maya, you know, just ignored him and kind of started walking faster towards her bus stop. So Mark then drove a little further up the road and stopped at a point where Maya would have to walk past him. And as she approached, he got out of the car and he exposed himself to her and Maya laughed at his little shriveled junk. As I mentioned earlier, he really got off on the horrified and disgusted and shocked looks that he would get from women. So when Maya laughed at him, he got really offended. Without even adjusting or pulling up his pants, he grabbed Maya from behind, pulled her to the ground and murdered her. He then dumped her body at the old disused Payneham patrol base, which was nearby. A few hours later at 10, 18 PM, Maya's body still hadn't been discovered and Mark wanted her body to be discovered. So he went to a payphone that was just 50 meters away from where he dumped her body and he called triple zero and he was like, look, there's someone sketchy at the old Payneham police station and it looks like they might break in. So you should come and check it out. Hello. Hello. Yeah, there's uh, someone hanging around the old uh, Payneham police station. Now this part's a little bit confusing, but there was actually two disused police bases. There was an old disused Paynham patrol base and an old disused Paynham police station. And her body was dumped at the patrol base. So after this triple zero call, an officer from the Norwood police station went down to check things out, but he went to the old disused police station. So obviously he didn't find anything because her body wasn't there. So Mark's all pissed off that they didn't discover the body. So at 11.50 p.m. he calls triple zero again, but this time from a payphone 20 minutes away at the Royal Adelaide Hospital. And he reported that he had seen a body in the bushes at the old Payne and Police Station. Yeah, it's a past the old Payne and Police Station. There seems to be a, a body. Police sent out a car, but again, they went to the police station. So they didn't find anything, obviously, because Maya's body wasn't there. I know the police station and patrol base thing is a little confusing and it's also a little confusing because Mark kept telling them at the police station, she's at the police station, there's a body at the police station, but her body was actually at the patrol base, Mark. Get it together, mate. A few days later, on the 17th of April at 10.25 a.m., a few residents who lived near the old Payne and Patrol base reported seeing a taxi there with its hazard lights on. And then just seven minutes later, officers at the Norwood police station found a note on the windscreen of one of their patrol cars, which said, there's a dead girl's body in the shrubs of the ground near the main road of Payne and Police Station. This is no joke, take a good look. So officers went down and this time they went to the old patrol base and that is where they discovered the partially decomposed body of a young woman. Mayor Jackick's body was discovered on Saturday night after a note was left on the windscreen of a patrol car at the Norwood police station. Her jeans and underwear had been removed, which indicated that this had been a sexually motivated crime. 
She was still clothed from the waist up, but her outer shirt was found tied around her neck and had been used to strangle her, so her cause of death was asphyxiation by her own shirt. Police immediately got underway trying to identify the body, and it was like infested with maggots because it had clearly been there for quite a few days at this point, and so they got out an entomologist, and I actually find this part really interesting. I mean, it's kind of gross because maggots, but it's really interesting that they can use maggots to determine determine the time of death. Basically, the entomologist figured out what kind of flies those maggots represented and then used the temperature from the last few days and the temperature of the body to figure out how long those maggots had been there because I guess, you know, flies lay eggs and different species of flies take longer for their eggs to develop into maggots and then different you know, species of flies take longer for their maggots to develop into flies. Does that make sense? It's kind of gross, but it's also really cool, like, police work. But based on all of that information, he was able to determine that the body became infested by maggots on the morning of the 13th of April, meaning that the body had been dumped there on the night of the 12th of April, which is five days before her body was found. There were no personal effects found on the body at all, so they weren't able to use, like, an ID or a wallet or anything to identify her. They did find that this this woman had three missing teeth in her upper jaw and a couple of restorations which was unique enough that they thought they'd be able to quickly identify her if there was a missing persons report so they went through all of the reports of missing women from around that time and based on you know general height description hair color that sort of thing they were able to narrow it down to one report that was filed on the 6th of april which was that of maya jackich her age, height, and hair color matched the general description of the body that was found, and her missing persons report indicated she lived near the crime scene, but it also indicated that she wore a dental plate to hide three missing teeth, the same three teeth that the victim was missing, and so the body was positively identified as that of 30-year-old Maya Jackich. The investigation into the murder got underway immediately, but it was pretty slow moving in terms of evidence. There was no evidence found at the crime scene, and smears and swabs that were taken in the post-mortem exam showed that there was no DNA and no semen found on or inside Maya, which could possibly be attributed to how decomposed her body was. Police interviewed her family and friends and found that she didn't really have any enemies and she generally kept to herself. On the 21st of April, somebody brought in her handbag, which they had found back on the 10th of April in Virginia while on a walk. And as soon as they heard about the murder, they brought it in. It had her passports in it, her credit card in it. Police went and searched the area that it was found, but found no extra evidence, no extra clues. And they also determined that the handbag wasn't the handbag she had been using the night that she was murdered. Police also really wanted to speak to the man who made those triple zero calls because they believed, you know, if he didn't kill her, then he definitely knew something or saw something that prompted him to make those calls so they released the triple zero calls to the public as well as the note that was left on the windshield of the police car in the hopes that the man would come forward or maybe someone he knew would come forward but despite getting hundreds of calls from the public, they got no solid leads. They also then released a $100,000 reward for any information, but this also failed to turn up any leads. By the 10th of April in 2000, a mannequin, which was dressed in clothes identical to the clothes Maya had been wearing, was put on display at the police expo just outside of the city to see if it would jog people's memories, but unfortunately it didn't garner any new leads. By this point, the investigation was at a bit of a standstill and it was scaled back. Now, while the investigation was still ongoing in late 1999, Mark Russ was sentenced to a minimum of 20 months in jail for trespassing, giving a false name and indecent exposure in a public space. He was released on the 23rd of July in 2001 and just 10 days later, on the 2nd of August, he attacked an 18-year-old at Cumberland Park. She had stopped on Goodwood Road to use the ATM there when Mark came up to her in her car, dragged her from her car, and blocked her from being able to escape with his body while he masturbated in front of her. Eventually, she drummed up the courage to push him. He fell to the ground. She ran back to her car, and she reversed down Goodwood Road at high speed, which is like a busy main road because she was so scared by what had happened. And Mark had also gotten up and started walking toward her. She just 
straight to her boyfriend's house, told him everything that had happened, and he immediately called the police to report the incident. But to the best of my knowledge, nothing came of that report because I don't believe they were able to identify Mark. And you know, it's so sad that things like this can happen, but the suspect is so hard to identify that they just get away with it, they're not reprimanded, there's no consequences for their action, but it leaves the victim with lifelong scars. This is a quote from what the woman said after the attack. She said, I have a constant fear of being on my own. I'm constantly checking doors and windows and I have panic attacks when I'm driving my car on my own and people walk near it. I constantly feel vulnerable and not safe. I don't sleep well. I'm constantly having nightmares and waking up at all hours of the night. Megumi Suzuki was born in Japan and lived in Shizuka Prefecture south of Tokyo with her parents Masako and Yuchi. Her parents took in a homestay from Adelaide named Chris Hamilton who moved to Japan after finishing year 12 and he and Megumi spoke about South Australia all the time and what it was like and it actually inspired Megumi to move to Adelaide herself in October of 2000 when she was 17. Her dream was to become a counsellor for overseas students in Japan which is why she moved to Australia in the first place and she enrolled in the Academy of English at Ironsbury College. She was living at the Torrens Valley International Residence in Modbury which is just a 15 minute bus ride from Adelaide and housed 20 other Japanese students which Megumi quickly became friends with. She was described as a vivacious, outgoing girl who loved fashion and hamburgers and hot chips and going out to do some late night karaoke. She had a really close relationship with her parents and called them once a week. And her dad said, I had loved my daughter since she was born, only thinking of her happiness and looking after her with love and care. My daughter was my dream and my hope. After moving to Australia, Megumi continued to hang out with Chris Hamilton quite a lot and they started dating and Chris actually contacted Megumi's school and her parents back in Japan to let them know that he was worried about her because she always seemed to end up in these pretty dangerous situations and so after hearing this, Megumi's parents brought her back to Japan and allowed her to return back to South Australia in early 2001. On the 1st of August in 2001, Megumi spoke to her father on the phone and told him, don't worry, I'm fine, I love you, but that would be the last conversation that they would ever have. On the 3rd of August, Megumi left her residence at 7.41am and went to school and she was seen on security footage leaving the school at 3.08pm. She went to Rundle Moor where she had some coffee with friends that afternoon and it was the last time that she was ever seen alive. One of her friends from coffee was the last person to ever speak to her. She said she spoke to her at 7pm and that Megumi was on her way to the bus stop on Grenfell Street where she was going to catch the bus back to her residence. Later that night at 10.30pm, Mark Rust was filling his car up at a service station when he saw Megumi listening to her CD player while waiting at a bus stop on Goodwood Road. Goodwood Road was about 13 minutes from Grenfell Street where her friend said she was catching the bus from, so I don't know if maybe she was like moving from one bus to another or why she was there, but it was 30 minutes in the opposite direction of her apartment. But anyway, Mark Rust went up to her, he grabbed her and put his hand over her mouth to stop her from screaming and he pulled his pants down but he couldn't get hard and he was all embarrassed so he tried to strangle her but he couldn't do that either which embarrassed him even more so he grabbed a nearby rock and bashed her to death. He then wrapped Megumi's body in some plastic sheets and dumped her body in an industrial bin behind some shops. Four days later on the 8th of August when Megumi didn't show up for classes, the international student advisor Anne Wheaton called Megumi's friends and asked them to check her room and see if she was still there and they said that she wasn't there and that nothing in her room had been touched and even her census from Friday the 3rd was still sitting on her bed unfilled. She contacted Megumi's parents right away and her mother said that Megumi never went anywhere without her teddy and her teddy was still found in her room. And then contact Megumi's then ex-boyfriend Chris to see if they had spoken because they spoke every day and he said that he hadn't heard from her either and that he was also starting to get a little worried. So that afternoon Anne contacted the police and reported Megumi missing. Megumi's mother Masako got on a plane from Japan to Adelaide right away and her father Yuchi followed a few days later. Police began their search right away. They made public appeals, spoke to friends and family and by the 14th of August they were handing out missing persons 
flyers along Rundle Moor because at this point they didn't know if they were looking at a homicide or a missing person. On the 15th of August, a man who worked as a maintenance worker along the Oban bus track that Megumi took home every day rang the police and said he'd found Megumi's bags in some bushes in Campbelltown and her phone and CD Walkman were missing from the bag. The bag still contained some of her books, her ID, her makeup, her pencil case, her credit card and her bus ticket and the credit card and bus ticket showed that she had gone to a BP servo in the opposite direction of her home and this is when police started to realise that they might be looking at a homicide. That same day, SES, mounted police and a police helicopter searched along the bus track but found no new leads. A team of 40 officers also visited karaoke bars, nightclubs and hotels around Adelaide on the weekend searching for her, questioning workers and patrons and handing out missing persons posters. Police were also trying to figure out why she was traveling away from her house, if she was going to meet somebody or what was out there. Police went and questioned the BP console operator and they were able to tell police that she had purchased a SIM card and exactly what time she purchased that SIM card as well. So police went and looked at her call charge records and found that she had made 12 calls that night and the last form of contact she had was she sent a text to her ex-boyfriend Chris Hamilton who lived right by the BP. So police went to question him and they found that he had been out with friends the night Megumi disappeared. He was super helpful with the investigation and he was devastated that Megumi was missing. About a week later, he contacted police to let them know he believed he had found some of Megumi's underwear near his house and police confirmed through DNA testing that they were Megumi's and they also found that the bra from the underwear set was missing from her property. So police were like, that's weird, you know, they just kind of showed up out of thin air, just like how that note showed up on the cop's windshield. And so that is how Chris Hamilton became their prime suspect. They took him in for questioning and they basically told him, like, either you killed her or you're the reason she's dead. It was really sad, actually, because the whole thing kind of ruined his life. This is a quote from what he said about that time period. He said, Megumi's disappearance was the most traumatic thing that has ever happened in my entire life, but it was only the beginning of the suffering I went through. I was the only suspect in the ensuing investigation and I suffered greatly at the hands of the police. I was their scapegoat. The police all but named me as the killer. Even my close friends became suspicious of me. Meanwhile, as police are hassling this poor guy Chris, Mark Russ sexually assaulted another woman on the 16th of August. This woman had been working late in her office building on Kensington Road and Rose Park, which was just a few kilometers from where Maya Jackick's body was dumped. At 8.50 p.m., all of the lights in her office building went out, and when she went to look out the window to check the surrounding buildings, they all still had their lights on. She also noticed that her computer was still on, so it was just the lights that had gone out, not the power. Unbeknownst to her, Mark had actually gone into the office building's fuse box and cut the lights for her office. So she decided to leave the office and as she was walking towards the door, she noticed a man in the shadows with a box cutting knife and a balaclava and she asked him what he wanted. Mark then pushed her to the ground and removed his balaclava and she was doing everything that she could to try and stay alive. So she was trying to stay calm, she was trying to comply with all of his demands so that he wouldn't kill her. So when he removed his balaclava, she told him like, I'm not looking at you, I can't see your face, I haven't seen what you look like. Russ then rolled her onto his stomach, told her I'm gonna kill you, and then he forced her to hold onto his knife as he raped her with his flaccid penis, trusting that she would be too scared to attack him with it. After a few seconds when he was done, he pulled his pants up, took the knife back, pulled the phone out of the wall before leaving the building. The woman then ran out of the building herself and as she did, she was memorizing all of the number plates from the cars in the area, specifically the cars in the car park of her building, so that when she reported it to police, she could give this information to them and they were able to check this information against the database of sexual offenders and they got a match to Mark Rust. Which can I just say, how incredible of this woman, like it would have been just such a disgusting, shocking and overwhelming time, yet she still managed to memorize a bunch of car number plates. 
which in turn helped to catch Mark Rust. Just amazing. So anyway, police went straight to his parole address in Gills Plains and arrested him, and he was sent to Port Augusta Prison, which is around 300 kilometers north of Adelaide. He was permitted to bring a few personal items along with him, and one of the items that he brought with him was Megumi's CD player, but at this point, neither this attack nor Rust had been connected to Megumi or Maya's murders, and just two days later, they would be thrown off the trail even more when there was a sighting of Megumi. On the 18th of August, two witnesses claimed that they had seen Megumi at 11.30 a.m. that morning at the Ark Harbor Hotel in Fullerton. They said she had been wearing a wig and that they called her name and she ran away. So police immediately started this huge search of the area. 12 patrol cars were sent out, streets surrounding the Howard Florey Reserve were blocked off as the dog squad and uniform patrols did a door knock investigation of every single home in the area. The whole investigation pretty much did like a 180 at this point because police were like, oh yeah, she's alive based on this one sighting from these two random people that don't even know her and might have just been confused because they said that she was wearing a wig anyway. I'm just glad that she's been sighted because uh, she's not dead, that's the main thing. Good for her parents to know that she's okay and safe and sound. You, you wouldn't want to be in that position yourself. And the investigation changed from a murder investigation into a manhunt because they were like, oh, she's just run away. And you know, despite the fact that this investigation completely changed, police were still looking into this guy, Chris. They were like, okay, well, if she's run away, he's probably helped her run away. And you know, she may have run away because her parents didn't approve of him and he's helping her hide. It's Chris, it's this guy. They just really had tunnel vision on him. The next day on the 19th of August, her parents released a public plea where they basically said they would forgive her for everything if she would just simply make contact and let them know that she was okay. But of course they got no response. Megumi, if you saw this, please come forward as soon as possible. Father and the mother can't sleep every day. Megumi. Don't worry about anything. Please come forward as soon as possible. Father and the mother will protect you from now on. Please come forward. Police also went out and released more images of Megumi in the hopes that they would jog more people's memories and maybe get some more people coming forward with some other sightings. I'm going to read you now a quote from Detective Superintendent Paul Schramm. He released a statement which said, There is now a strong likelihood that Megumi is, in fact, still alive. I would like to make an appeal to Megumi. You have seen the plea by your parents. You have seen the impact and the response by them. I am aware it may be embarrassing for you to come forward, but I can only say it will become more embarrassing the longer this continues. I would make a plea to her and to anyone who may be looking after her to please come forward now. To continue this charade, if indeed that is what it is, can only make things worse. And then just a few days later, on the 23rd of August, they switched things up again and said they had given up hope on trying to find her alive and they now once again believed that she had been murdered and that this was going to be a murder investigation. They said that they hadn't found anything to support the sighting on the 18th by, again, these two random people who didn't know Megumi and who said that she may have been wearing a wig, like the most unreliable sighting ever in my opinion. And they also said that if she was still alive, surely somebody would have come forward with some information by now. So police went straight back to Chris and once again told him, if you didn't kill her, you're responsible for her death. And they went hard for him, so hard that he actually attempted suicide. On the 25th of August, Megumi's parents returned to Japan because they had commitments over there and it was also their son's birthday. So they went back over there and at around the same time, the police investigation was also scaled back and the task force was scaled back from 40 officers to 12. Eight weeks after Megumi's murder on the 1st of October, police put her photos and Maya Jackick's photos on this new police website that had just been developed and this is when the public started to really compare the two cases. 
The police also set up a free to call 1800 number, which played the two triple zero calls from Maya Jackick's murder on repeat. And they also announced that they would refund anyone who called this number from a payphone. Hundreds and hundreds of people called up this phone line to hear the triple zero calls. And one of those people was actually Mark Russ's brother, Stephen. He listened to it over and over and over again and was like, yep. Yeah. That's my brother, so he ended up calling Crime Stoppers. He'd actually been away for a couple of years and had only just recently gotten back, so he'd only just recently seen the publicity of the case. So when he listened to those triple zero calls, he was pretty sure it was Mark because Mark had obviously been in trouble with the law quite a bit previously. The call alone wasn't enough to arrest Mark, so Stephen actually ended up providing a letter that Mark had written him so that police could compare his handwriting to the handwriting on the note found on the police windshield that alerted them to Maya's body. Pretty much every single letter and every single word that could be compared from the two letters looked identical, and so it was pretty obvious that they were written by the same person. Police also believed that the taxi that was seen by a few witnesses outside the old Payne and police station with its hazards on was also Mark who had been checking to see if Maya's body was still there before leaving the note because obviously he used to work as a taxi driver. Meanwhile, police also received word from an informant from the Port Augusta prison. He was Mark's cellmate and he said that Mark admitted to him that he had killed Maya Jackick and Megumi Suzuki and that he had killed Megumi on a vacant paddock and that he had burnt her clothing on this paddock, which we'll get to in a second. So after getting this information, police immediately go and do a search of Mark's prison cell, and it's there that they find Megumi's CD player. Unfortunately though, finding him in possession of the CD player wasn't enough to arrest him for Megumi's murder, but he was the prime suspect. On the 21st of October, major crime squad detectives went to the Port Augusta prison and formally charged Mark Russ with the murder of Maya Jackick thanks to his brother's Crime Stoppers call. After this, police go back to the BP, which is where Megumi was last known to have purchased a SIM card, and right across from the BP is a vacant plot of land. When they searched the lot, they found the remains of a campfire, so they called the fire brigade, who confirmed that they had put out a small fire there on the night Megumi disappeared, and near the fire, they also found a rock which could have been used as the murder weapon. They also found bracelets and bits of burnt clothing. The informant also told police that Mark had told him that he had put Megumi's body in an industrial rubbish bin so police had a look around the area which is when they found a Colex rubbish bin on Goodwood Road and they were able to confirm that it was the bin Megumi's body had been placed in and Mark was then charged with Megumi's murder on the 30th of October. Police were also able to determine that the rubbish from the bin Megumi's body was dumped in was taken to the Waste Management Center in Wingfield. They processed 500 tons of rubbish there a day, so it was going to be a massive task to go through it. On the 31st of October, Megumi's parents Masako and Yuchi returned from Japan to Adelaide and they released a heartbreaking press conference. They said, this week we received the saddest news we could have. Megumi was only 18 years old. She was at the age when life was beginning to open up. She will not be able to live what should have been the best years of her life. We desperately wish for her body to be found. We don't want to leave her alone for too long. We want to take her back to Japan to be with family. Following Maya's murder, her parents John and Jagoda also divorced because of the strain the murder put on their marriage. Jagoda said, My life is now going to the cemetery every day, no matter if it is rain or snow, no matter if it's 38 degrees or negative 5 degrees. That's my future for the rest of my life. My life is sad and monotonous, always the same. The search of the Wingfield Waste Management Center began on the 26th of November with over 200 officers and community volunteers. The Waste Management Services luckily kept a really good record, so they were able to refine the search to a 50 square meter area, which contained all of August's waste, but there were still 10,000 one-ton bales to go through in that area. 
It was super hot. I mean, it was November in Australia. It was pushing 35 degrees every day. There was hardly any shade. There were flies. There was dust everywhere from who knows what kind of substances. And they had to go through each bale individually, one by one. And they had to go through all of the rubbish in those bales, looking at like newspapers and letters that could show them what date this bale of rubbish was from. It was not a pleasant task, to say the least. Eventually, after 11 days, on the 7th of December, Megumi's body was found. The bra that she was wearing was also an exact match to the underwear that Chris Hamilton had found near his house. Now, at first, Mark Rust denied having anything to do with the two murders and pled innocent. But then exactly one year after Megumi's body was found, he changed his plea in her murder to guilty. Six months later, he also changed his plea to guilty in the Maya Jackick murder and admitted to the ATM assault and the Rose Park rape. On the 27th of November in 2003, Justice Margaret Nyland wanted the victims of Mark's crimes to be able to come forward and tell him face to face how much pain they suffered because of him. Jagoda Jackick and Yuchi and Masako Suzuki didn't attend because they were all overseas by this point. Maya's friend Eva Gregov did attend this though to give a statement, which I'm going to read now. She said, I can only say to you that you have not only killed and taken the life of Maya, you have also completely destroyed the life of her family. Fuse Simpson, who served as a translator for the Suzuki family on their trips to Australia, read their statements as well. Masako's read, It drives me insane when I think about Megumi being treated like rubbish and burning in a rubbish dump for four months. My heart becomes filled with bitterness and anger when I think about how my daughter's dreams and future were stolen. Why did she, who wanted to help others, have to be killed? I hate Rust so much as to feel I could kill him. The law should be more severe to murderers. Yuchi's statement read, Can you understand a father's feeling that I will never again be called Papa by my beautiful daughter? I'm so sad that I will not hear her voice again. Rust brutally ended our daughter's precious life when she was just about to blossom and left an eternal scar on our hearts. For this reason, I will never be able to forgive him. Chris Hamilton also gave a statement. It was super emotional and he was practically yelling at Mark as he read it. He said, My life has been all but destroyed since the murder. I'm a mere shadow of who I used to be and now I have nothing left to live for. You did the most despicable and awful thing anyone could do to such a beautiful young person. You took her life and ruined the lives of those who cared for her. You have as good as killed me too. Just know that I will spend whole days at her grave in Centennial Park crying and retching. Because of your disgusting nature and incapability of the police team who handled her case, I have now become as a dead man would be, having no desire to live and no dreams left. There is no way you can be punished sufficiently for all that you have done, for the horrors you have brought into this world of horrors. May you outlive me in your life of suffering. Five months later, on the 27th of April in 2004, Justice Nyland sentenced Mark Aaron Rust to jail without the possibility of parole for both murders. She ruled that he was incapable of controlling his sexual urges and would be detained until further order. In September of 2014, Mark applied for a non-parole period, which would basically allow him to apply for parole so that he could eventually be released. Prison authorities did, however, speak out against this and said that he was aggressive and abusive towards prison guards. In addition to his sentence, Mark was also subject to an indefinite detention order, which basically means even if he was eligible for parole, the detention order would make it so that he's not able to be released anyway. Following the murders, Maya's mother took her body back to Croatia, where she visits her grave every day. Megumi was cremated in Adelaide and her parents then took her ashes back to Japan. But that is all of the information that I have on this case. As always, I would love to discuss your thoughts in the comments down below. I hope you guys have an incredible rest of your day and hopefully I will see you in my next video. Bye guys.